Good evening and welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Kali Deep Chowdhury and I'm here to talk to our distinguished guest, Council General Neil Ferrer, about the Philippines and its evolving opportunities and challenges facing that wondrous country. A special welcome to all of you, including our online participants. This program is a focus on Southeast Asia from the Asia Pacific Affairs Forum. Thank you for joining us. We encourage you to become a member of the club and to learn more, please visit the club's website. Well, let us begin now. If you were to ask most students of history as to who was the first person to circumnavigate the globe, they will tell you very quickly and with great confidence that that person is Ferdinand Magellan. My guest tonight will disagree. He will tell you even more quickly and with greater confidence that Ferdinand Magellan was not the first person to circumnavigate the globe. And he is right. He is right because Ferdinand Magellan's life came to a grisly end on what is now the, on the, in the Philippines in the Mactan Island. Ferdinand Magellan was hacked to death by the Filipino people. <laughs> now, I know quite a few Filipino people. They are without doubt the most hospitable, the most generous, and the most convivial of hosts. So what was it about Senior Magellan <laughs> that upset the Filipino people so much? I don't know, <laughs> but on this Council General Ferrer, I'm on your side. <laughs> so why are we here? We're here to talk about the Philippines, and let me start off with the map of the Philippines. As you can see on the barely seen uh, figure on the left-hand side, it tells you how far the Philippines is away from San Francisco, close to 7,000 nautical miles away. It is an ar archipelago of nations. 7,000 islands in all, many with their own culture, language, and religion. And as you can see, if you now move to the right-hand side, if you focus on the, on, on the Philippines itself, it occupies a position of enormous geopolitical significance for three reasons. The first reason is take a look at its neighbors. You have Indonesia below you, you have Vietnam to the left, and then you have China on, on the north. And then you have Taiwan directly above the Philippines. And so tonight we'll be talking to Council General Ferrer about the significance of it, the strategic location of the Philippines. So that's number one. The second thing is, again, if you take a closer look, you will see that the Philippines sits on a vast expanse of ocean. There's nothing really to protect the Philippines mm -hmm from the increasing number of typhoons, the increasing intensities of the storms that are hitting the Philippines every day and every year. And so we will talk again to the Council General, what are the implications to the economy of the Philippines? What does global warming truly mean for the island nation? And the third topic that I'll be focusing on is the economy. As the Philippines makes its way through middle income status to an upper middle income status, how does a nation that is focused on services, transition to a manufacturing uh, state. So those are the three areas that I'll be focusing on. And in the meantime, if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to address them as time goes by. But with that, let us now turn attention to our guest, Council General Neil Ferrer. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, your role, and how did you get here to the audience? <laughs> Well, uh, thank you, Kalidip, and uh, I would like to thank, of course, the um, Commonwealth Club, uh, World Affairs of California, for inviting me here, and I would like to greet uh, your members and guests and everyone present today. Um, well, I'd like to comment first on Ferdinand Magellan, you know, because that, that <laughs> piqued my interest, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Ferdinand Magellan, he... Yeah, he was the first person to circumnavigate the world, but unfortunately he met his end uh, in the Philippines. But uh, it was uh, 
to me an eye opening for the rest of the world you know so uh, it introduced that there is this uh, uh, nation in uh, the Far East, you know, that is rich in natural resources, uh, people very proud of their, you know, their history, their identity, and um, we're surprised to have uh, somebody foreign coming coming over. But that was not the end of the story, of course, you know. I believe the Spanish government who sent Ferdinand Magellan, who happens to be Portuguese, you know, learned a lesson from that and 40 years later, you know, they sent another expedition to the Philippines and it was a different story altogether, you know, so uh, if I'm not mistaken if my memory is right, I think it was uh, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi who, who came around 1565, so over 40 years after uh, Ferdinand Magellan and uh, the approach of uh, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi was quite different. He befriended the people. There was a blood compact with the local uh, leaders. And that started, you know, the over 300 years of uh, the Philippines uh, being under the colony uh, of Spain, you know. And the Philippines uh, has become, you know, a, a Christian nation uh, with very rich, you know history and experience. And it so happened also uh, arising from that uh, incident of uh, uh, the Spanish going back to the Philippines. Uh, the trade flourish between the Philippines and the Spanish territory. In fact, uh, Mexico, uh, uh, specifically at the time, they, they, uh, Spain occupied Mexico at the time, and uh, the Manila Acapulco Galleon trade was very flourishing. And uh, the first uh, recorded uh, presence of Filipinos to the United States happened uh, during the time of uh, Spanish occupation of the Philippines. They brought this uh, uh, vessel uh, going further north, you know, from Mexico going up to, uh, they landed here in California in, in Morro Bay, and that was in 1587. So that was the first recorded presence of Filipinos coming over to mainland uh, United States, you know. so predating the founding of the uh, U.S. Uh, as a nation. So uh, we have a very long, uh, rich history since then. But now on your question about myself, uh, I assume my post as Consul General uh, in San Francisco uh, about almost three, more than three years ago, you know, in, I assume it in January 2021 uh, at the height of the pandemic. And uh, I've been in the Foreign Service uh, uh, for, I'm a career diplomat, and I've been in the Foreign Service for 28 years now. You know. I've been assigned at the Philippine embassies in Beijing, China, in London, United Kingdom, and in Ottawa, Canada. I previously served also as Consul General of the Philippines in Vancouver, Canada. And uh, before I assumed my office here in San Francisco, I served as the Assistant Secretary for Consular Affairs. Well, it's a great uh, privilege for me to be serving here in San Francisco, which is one of our largest foreign service posts globally in terms of the geographic area of scope, but uh, most importantly in terms of the number of overseas Filipinos that we cover. The consulate here in San Francisco, we cover uh, you know, the U.S. Pacific Northwest states as well as the mountain states. So from Northern California to Oregon, Washington, all the way up to Alaska and the mountain states of um, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and Northern Nevada. So 10 states all in all. And there are approximately 1.3 million Filipinos and Filipino-Americans within our jurisdiction, uh, 700,000 of whom reside you know, around the Bay Area. So the consulate is quite busy in terms of providing consular services to our nationals. In fact, we had a team that traveled recently to Oregon to provide consular services uh, to uh, our nationals in Oregon as well as the, the nearby states. So we're quite busy uh, in terms of uh, the provision of consular services, but uh, the consulate is also very much engaged uh, in economic diplomacy that is promoting uh, uh, trade, investment, and tourism to the Philippines. Earlier on, we have seen the videos you know, about tourism in the Philippines. Uh, uh, we're hoping that you could visit uh, the Philippines uh, in the future. We have uh, many uh, 
tours and trips uh, that we organize. And my colleagues from the Department of Tourism is here, uh, our tourism representative, uh, Ms. Soleil Tropicales, and we also have colleagues here from our trade. Uh, one quick question before we move on. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume this isn't your first interaction with the United States. You've been here before? I've been here uh, before on uh, different occasions, of course, either personal visits or official visits, but this is my first time to be assigned here as a foreign service officer. Yeah. Mm. So, President Marcos has had a number of interactions, mm. direct meetings with President Biden over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And most recently, he's had a meeting with the Premier of Japan. Mm. Could you update for this audience mm. and for those listening in, mm -hmm. what was the purpose of this meeting? Mm and why there were so meetings in the last couple of years? Mm. Uh, uh, well, uh, first of all, I would like to underline, and I have some notes here, and just to be very clear, the United States is an important ally and partner and uh, friend uh, to the Philippines. And Philippines-U.S. relations are premised on mutual respect and our acknowledgement of each other as equal and sovereign partners. And this year, actually, we will be celebrating 78 years of our uh, diplomatic relations. And uh, our bilateral re relations remain robust and benefits from continuing positive momentum in security and defense cooperation, economic cooperation, as well as broader and deeper engagements across other areas of mutual interest. And over the past year, the Philippines and the United States achieved significant milestones uh, with the U.S. expressing its unequivocal commitment to our alliance and the conscious effort of both sides to put economic cooperation at the forefront of the bilateral agenda. And the recent uh, high-level exchanges uh, would attest to the strength of these relations, as you have rightly pointed out, you know, the meeting between uh, the president and uh, uh, President Joe Biden. And this is not their first meeting. Uh, president Marcos came here uh, way back in 2022 when he just assumed office. Uh, he attended uh, uh, the uh, meeting at the UN General Assembly, and he, he had the opportunity to meet with President Joe Biden at that time. And the following year, in 2023, he had an official visit to Washington, D.C., and uh, he again met with President Joe Biden. And last year, he attended, of course, the APEC uh, meeting here in San Francisco. And, and as you have noted just now, uh, three weeks ago, uh, they had a meeting uh, together, of course, with the Prime Minister of Japan. The uh, trilateral uh, meeting between the leaders of the United States, Japan, and the Philippines um, is the first ever you know, summit among these leaders. So this is very historic. And uh, according to the president, uh, uh, this is you know, this is a partnership that is born not of, not out of convenience nor of expediency, but as a natural progression of the deepening bilateral relations and economic cooperation among the three nations, linked by profound uh, commitment, you know, to democracy, good governance, and the rule of law. And uh, they have issued a joint statement uh, after uh, a joint vision statement uh, after the summit, which outlined you know various areas of engagement uh, between the three states. So we are very happy with the outcome of this very historic meeting uh, among the three nations. Thank you. Uh, but this engagement goes beyond just meetings. Mm. My understanding is that there'll be a meeting in Hawaii with the defense secretaries of the different countries, mm. including Australia. Uh, there seems to be now an upsurge of these meetings with the United States, mm -hmm. uh, which was somewhat at odds with the, previous, uh, with the previous administration under President Duterte. How has the policies under President Marcos changed with the policies of President Duterte? Mm -hmm. I, I would not necessarily categorize it as at odds. You know, uh, different presidents, they have different, you know, uh, perspectives and priorities of what they believe would be in the best interest of the country. So, uh, and I believe that President Duterte has pursued it uh, based on his own assessment of what is the, the, to the vital interest uh, of the Philippines. And now, of course, President Marcos is uh, approaching it uh, uh, also in his own uh, uh, perspectives. Essentially, the president is advocating for peace at the same time promoting the country's uh, national interest. And you're right uh, in pointing out that there will be uh, many other meetings uh, among uh, our our leaders and officials. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the trilateral uh, meeting between the three leaders 
was born out of, you know, not just uh, because of what is being done by the current government, but this builds upon the decades of partnership and engagements uh, among these three nations, you know. Both the U.S. and Japan, they are our major trading and investment partners. Uh, so most of our goods are um, exported to these countries. They are also our major uh, investors in the country. They employ thousands of, you know, uh, uh, workers, you know, their companies uh, uh, back in the Philippines. And at the same time, uh, Philippine companies are coming to the United States, uh, also coming and engaging with Japan. We have our own uh, people working um, uh, uh, in Japan and here in the U.S. We have over 4.3 million Filipino Americans. So there are many uh, areas, you know, of our uh, engagement and cooperation with these countries. And now I think it, uh, the engagement among the three le leaders uh, is building upon, you know, the uh, the recent. Uh, emphasis by the countries in terms of engaging at different levels of, of government. And uh, uh, I would also uh, wish to point out that you know, prior to the summit uh, meeting by the three leaders, uh, there had been meetings uh, already by their foreign ministers, uh, by their national security advi advisors, and also by uh, by their defense officials. So, uh, yeah, uh, things have been happening at, at at different levels, and now we are, of course, very pleased that uh, we've seen this uh, trilateral summit uh, among the three leaders, and hopefully this will be sustained and continued uh, into the future. Thank you. So let me probe a little bit more into the reasons why, especially for our audience, as to why uh, the countries are meeting. Uh, Councilor General Ferrer, if you could take a quick look at this screen on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. What you're really talking about the South China Sea, mm -hmm. and we're talking about the massive <coughs> militarization of the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, it is without a question that the Chinese are building up rapidly into land that is claimed not just by the Philippines but by its neighboring countries. Uh, what does maritime law say about uh, the nautical miles that you could have to, to claim access to a land? Yeah, uh, well, uh, of course, the, the, you know, the law as far as you know, the entitlements of each country are you know, set uh, long time ago, you know, the countries have agreed uh, uh, with, uh, with the uh, an international instrument. It's called the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. You know, so essentially, uh, uh, from one's territory, uh, then you can project your territorial sea, which is 12 nautical miles, then followed by another 12 nautical miles contiguous zone, and. Uh, up to 200 nautical miles, which is your exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. So these maritime entitlements are drawn from your boundaries. And these are all uh, codified and uh, uh, understood in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which most countries have ratified, including the Philippines. And so my understanding is that many of the lands that are now claimed by the Philippines mm -hmm. has now been encroached on and militarized by the, the Chinese government. They've built uh, air forces, airports, uh, harbors. And if you cannot, you cannot open a newspaper now in the United States without reading about the harassment with which the, the Filipino fishermen, uh, the Filipino Coast Guard face almost every day. Mm. Uh, how does the Philippines address that issue? Mm. Uh, well, uh, we have an uh, existing mechanisms of uh, engaging with China. You know, we have a foreign ministry consultations. We also have a uh, uh, at senior officials' levels of uh, consultation, so that's on the bilateral level. But uh, and we've done that, you know, uh, for uh, a very long time. Uh, in fact, I mentioned earlier that uh, I was assigned in Beijing, uh, even way back when I was uh, assigned there as a young junior diplomat. We've had such uh, exchanges uh, and dialogues uh, with Beijing on on a host of other issues, you know, not just, of course. Uh, the conflicting uh, claims on the South China Sea. Uh, but uh, over the years, you know, uh, we've seen very little progress on that, and that is why the Philippines, uh, back in 2013, we have uh, uh, brought the issue uh, 
to an international arbitration. You know, we initiated an, uh, proceedings under Annex 7 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which where China is also a participant, um, constituting uh, uh, a tribunal to look at the issues uh, you know, being faced you know, uh, by the Philippines as we relate to, to, to China on the matter. And uh, three years later, uh, of course, the arbitration panel, they have issued an award. Uh, and uh, it is a landmark award because they have clarified essentially the identity of you know the nature of the islands the rocks uh, in that area you know because uh, obviously uh, for it uh, mentioned earlier that you know you will draw uh, territorial sea and the rest you know from an uh, unidentified uh, feature but not all the features in the uh, in in the south china sea you know are able to to generate such entitlement in fact the, the tribunal ru ruled that none of them, you know, uh, qualify as an island, you know. Uh, so because there is a, you know, a, a general uh, uh, description and qualification of, you know, what is an island, you know, it's, uh, um, it can generate a life of its own, naturally form and the rest. So th apparently the features there in that area, they do not qualify based on the assessment of, of the tribunal. They have also uh, uh, looked at the very expansive uh, claims of China in that area, the famous nine dash line, you know. So essentially the tribunal was saying that that has no basis uh, uh, under international law, you know. So the UN Convention has li uh, limited, you know, uh, the, the scope and extent, you know, of your uh, maritime uh, entitlements. And uh, yeah, the tribunal also uh, recognized the issues that we raise in terms of you know the destruction of the marine environment, which uh, you have mentioned. They have built artificial islands there, military installation. These have uh, hampered and destroyed the natural habitat. You know, uh, the corals and the reefs uh, were destroyed. You know, by all this artificial island building, and uh, that was uh, noted by uh, by by the tribunal that there were violations in terms of uh, those uh, uh, actions being done. So uh, uh, in, in short, uh, I, uh, we believe that the uh, ruling by the arbitral tribunal has clarified you know, uh, the entitlements of the coastal states uh, within the South China Sea. Please bear in mind that uh, the issue of uh, conflicting claims there is not just between the Philippines and China. It involves other countries, uh, coastal states in the South China Sea, including Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, Taiwan also. Uh, Indonesia, uh, they're not directly part, but they also have some areas uh, f further down uh, there in the south. So there are many uh, uh, states which have uh, interests uh, as far as the uh, issues uh, in, 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 in the South China Sea. But I think most importantly, the international community is interested because the South China Sea, the uh, 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 the the islands uh, the the features in that area they occupy uh, strategic you know sea lanes of communication where uh, most of the commercial goods shipping passes through so there is an interest in preserving freedom of navigation and uh, yeah ensuring uh, stability in the area for the commerce you know uh, uh, to to pass uh, safely and freely uh, on top of the you know course concern about you know the marine environment and the resources uh, in, in, in the area so yeah for the Philippines uh, uh, the UN Convention on the law of the sea and most recently the 2016 uh, arbitral tribunal are the primary uh, focus whenever we engage and advocate for the peaceful resolution of the disputes in in, in the South China Sea also thank you thank you for clarifying uh, my next question is with two parts, because fact of the matter is it hasn't changed facts on the ground. In fact, it has led to further militarization mm -hmm. of the South China mm -hmm. Sea. Uh, have the Philippines have tried two tactics? The first question I have is, under President Duterte, there was a sense of reconciliation with the Chinese. There was a bend towards the, the foreign policy shifted more towards being friends with the Chinese and perhaps a little bit more antagonistic towards the United States. Mm -hmm. Has that policy helped the Philippines in resolving issues with China? 
Um, it, definitely during the time of uh, President Duterte, we've had uh, uh, closer relations uh, with China, but as you have uh, yeah, indeed acknowledged, the situation on the ground, uh, as f at least as far as the uh, conflicting issues uh, in the South China, has not uh, necessarily changed. You know? so, um, uh, yeah, but uh, that that is the reality. You know, China has rejected the, the uh, arbitral tribunal. You know, so but uh, uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, the South China Sea is not the sum uh, as far as our relations with China is concerned. You know, uh, China is uh, an important neighbor, a big neighbor of the Philippines, and an important trade trading partner. So we have to balance uh, uh, all those interests. We have to. Uh, uh, keep uh, talking uh, to each other and finding you know, common uh, solutions and ideas on how we can work together. The South China Sea uh, uh, presents enormous opportunities uh, for uh, engagement and cooperation. You know, I think it is uh, in the uh, uh, mutual interest of both the Philippines and China, for example, to preserve the the coral reefs, the marine e uh, ecosystem in that area, because they support uh, the habitat of the the fish and the other marine organi organism there. So, if we continue to destroy the environment, uh, it will have a long term impact as far as you know how many fish uh, will be able to reproduce and how many uh, uh, marine organisms uh, organisms you know will, will will prosper bear in mind that that area uh, 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 where the Philippines is uh, including that area of the South China Sea is part of what is uh, uh, known as the the coral triangle you know the global center of uh, marine biodiversity so uh, you the the most number of fish corals and marine organize, organisms are found within that coral triangle area so it is in the interest you know of of the countries uh, to really cooperate and to preserve and to protect uh, the, the marine environment so uh, military solution is very simplistic but at the end of the day it will not help you know because we will be destroying what is actually should be the benefit of, for the rest of humankind but it also goes beyond marine life. Mm -hmm. uh, that area is rich in natural resources. Mm -hmm. There's enormous reservoirs of gas and oil. Mm -hmm. uh, not, and then, of course, the fishermen from the Philippines mm -hmm. suffer because mm -hmm. they are not allowed to fish in the, in the fishing reefs. Mm -hmm. Does that now also build into the calculation? Definitely. You know, uh, it's uh, uh, a, a big source of our uh, livelihood, you know, of our uh, fishermen, you know. Uh, majority of uh, the protein you know being uh, consumed by filipinos are uh, coming from the sea you know from the fish you know so uh, because of our nature as an archipelago and our uh, fisher folks that are going to that area they are there essentially just for their own survival or livelihood these are not big fishing fleets you know harvesting hundreds or thousands of fish but it's really just a small bankas uh, trying to make a living for themselves and and their families and those are their traditional fishing grounds so yeah it there there we are of course uh, very mindful of that and um, it, you also noted that the area sits on you know vast resources of uh, oil and gas and uh, again if uh, uh, if we will be disputing on you know the ownership insisting on once you know uh, uh, ownership of the area then the option you know for us really exploring and exploiting the these resources will be you know will not happen so it to to us um, it's really important to have a very pragmatic uh, approach on this to understand the value of you know engaging and talking and finding really common ground on how to resolve and address uh, the issue you know for for our mutual benefit and this is not just between as i said between the philippines and china but there are also other claimant states uh in the region, you know, who also share similar interests. So um, it is essential that all the parties concerned really sit down, talk, and find ways on how they could cooperate, you know, um, and manage the the situation. 
nobody, and especially uh, not the Philippines, would like the situation to escalate, you know, uh, further, you know, to run out of control. Uh, so we want to uh, make the area an uh, area of peace, stability, security, and prosperity. That's the long-term vision for the South China Sea. No, thank you. And uh, one last question on the topic uh, before we move on. And the question is, you mentioned all the other nations. There's a general feeling that those nations have taken a bit of a backseat. That when it comes time to building these defense agreements, whether it's between the United States and Japan, the United States and Australia and the Philippines, is the Philippines that is taking the, the lead. The other countries are just sitting back and then waiting to see how things develop because they also realize that the U USA is far away, the China is close. Is there a reason why the Philippines chose to take a more aggressive uh, position in this matter, building these relationships with the United States, holding these uh, defense exercises with Australia and the United States? Mm. I think I mentioned a while ago that the Philippines has a long, well-established you know, historical, political, and economic relations with the U.S. In fact, the Philippines is the oldest uh, treaty ally of the United States in the Indo-Pacific. We have a mutual defense treaty way back in 1951. So those are historical facts. And of course, those are the framework and the basis of our engagement uh, with the U.S. And uh, given that that reality, I think it is expected for the Philippines to really, you know, uh, be active and uh, take, uh, uh, you know, I would say leadership or you know, a proactive role on on uh, on addressing these issues. Because uh, number one, our historical um, uh, connections and relations with the U.S., but I think most importantly, because it impacts and impinges on our national interests, you know, not just our territory, but also the economic livelihood and well-being uh, of our people. Thank you. Thank you, Council General, for, for those questions. I will now move on into a different topic, and the next topic is going to be uh, the economy. Uh, the Philippines is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Certainly, it's beaten out his Asian neighbors. Uh, and I think that it's, it's soon is going to reach an upper middle income status as a, as a company, uh, as a country. And I think the important uh, uh, the fact we noted is that it's a Trump-proof economy. And what do I mean by <laughs> Trump-proof uh, economy that is based on a services model where remittance comes from abroad? Uh, it is based on tourism as based on services. So the question that I have for you, as this is a very important year, the next couple of years are going to be very important, Council General, is how does a country like the Philippines, first of all, congratulations on being the, one of the fastest growing economies in the world. How does the Philippines maintain that current, that, that growth, uh, without running into some of the headwinds that other, con other countries that have this uh, ha have faced? And there was a recent article uh, by The Economist uh, relating to this one. And it, the Economist was uh, pointing out that the Philippines is quietly getting richer. You know, so, yeah, and uh, they, they did a fairly good, you know, look and assessment at what, ha what has been happening in the Philippines for the last 12, 14 years. You know, the country has been growing consistently on the average around 6% uh, every year. And as you've correctly pointed out, last year we were actually the fastest growing economy in the region. And this year, again, the, the forecast is that we will be able to sustain, uh, sustain that growth. And the reason for the uh, 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 fairly uh, good growth of the Philippine economy, uh, especially in, in recent times, because the Philippines is currently sitting in what is called as a demographic uh, sweet spot, meaning that our median age is uh, very low compared to our neighbors in the Asia Pacific. The median age right now in the Philippines is 26 years old. So the Philippines has a population of about 115, uh, 118 million people. So the median age for that is is, is 26. About 66, 67 percent of the population are in the labor force. So the the bulk of the peop the the population are you know contributing to the economic growth and and development of the country. And and um, according to the economists, we will be enjoying that the demographic sweet spot for the next 20, 30 years. So uh, and uh, as you've uh, noted, uh, we expect 
to uh, uh, graduate to an upper middle income country very soon, uh, possibly by next year. If not for the pandemic, we would actually have graduated sooner. But uh, obviously the pandemic uh, has put a break, uh, not just uh, on the growth in the Philippines, but the rest of the world f for that matter. So that's number one, the demographic sweet spot. Uh, but another reason uh, also is that our government, you know, for the last, you know, uh, 10, 12 decades, uh, 10, 12 years, uh, has been really focused uh, in, in terms of enacting the necessary legislations to improve the economy, you know, liberalizing the foreign investors' uh, 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 way of uh, entering the country and providing the necessary incentives, you know, opening the economy, uh, making sure that, you know, we've uh, had uh, economic uh, engagements and relations uh, uh, with the rest of the world. And also the Philippines uh, uh, has had a very um, uh, peaceful, you know, uh, turnover of uh, governments, you know, for the last, uh, what, five, six, we, we've never had any issue, you know, challenging the result of the election, you know, and contesting uh, those. Uh, the, 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 we've had a peaceful uh, turnover of power among our uh, leaders and governments uh, for the past yeah, uh, 12 years. We have a very uh, vibrant, you know, uh, democracy uh, working uh, in the country, and uh, yeah, th that is able to attract, you know, the, the investments coming coming over. But I think uh, it it is really our people, you know, hardworking, very talented, very uh, highly skilled, uh, uh, able to you know, take on you know the uh, challenges and the opportunities uh, being offered by you know uh, the current global economy, you know, uh, with emphasis on you know uh, AI, technology, innovation, and the rest. We've seen uh, the growth of uh, startups uh, in the country. And we've seen uh, uh, many companies so willing to uh, to enter and learn, uh, uh, of course, yeah, here in the U.S. and also in in, in the rest of the world. And yeah, uh, we're quite happy with the, with the direction uh, of the Philippine economy. And hopefully, this will be sustained, you know, um, in in the years to come. Well, thank you. Mm. I think what really stands out in the graph is the reliance on service-based remittance. Mm. Uh, how does, and so if you look at the other Asian countries, which have traditionally moved on into manufacturing, mm. the Philippines is one of the lowest in the manufacturing sector. Mm. Yet, given its level of education, how does the Philippines get into the upper status in the, so that it attracts more manufacturing jobs, mm. which many economists feel can help stabilize the economy and make it less dependent on remittance from abroad? Mm. Uh, well, actually, remittance from abroad just constitutes a, 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 a small oh, part so uh, of the, uh, the of the country's GDP. The the big part is really coming from services, as, as you've noted. Uh, the Philippines is the number one in terms of the business process uh, outsourcing uh, services. Uh, if, for example, you uh, uh, call your credit card, your telephone companies, uh, you uh, you may be surprised that the answer uh, the people that will be helping and assisting you are doing the, their work uh, in the Philippines. And it works quite well, especially here uh, with the U.S. because of the, the time zone uh, the difference. But it's not just the traditional call centers and, and those things. Uh, also, uh, support to uh, uh, digital uh, services, uh, medical services, um, technology, uh, and the work. So, yep. So that that segment of our uh, economy is is really growing, and we are uh, the, currently the leader uh, on that one. And uh, we are also starting to attract uh, light manufacturing uh, in, in uh, uh, like for example, in uh, um, uh, in uh, uh, servicing the the um, um, electronics uh, industry, the the semiconductor uh, uh, development. You know, so we've had those. Uh, 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 centers, you know, uh, in the Philippines. So, yeah. so all those uh, services and uh, light manufacturing are contributing to the growth of the of the economy. Well, thank you. Uh, we we started by talk you started by talking about the colonial legacy. Mm -hmm. Three hundred years of Spanish rule, fifty years of American rule. Mm -hmm. 
have they somewhat retarded the growth of the of the Philippines in the sense that in other countries there was a more of an equitable distribution of wealth and land. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about the economists, the economists pointed out the Philippines is one of the few countries in Asia which hasn't had that equitable distribution mm -hmm. of land and wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, some old families still control the resources. Uh, President uh, Duterte's father was a governor. Mm -hmm. His son, his daughter is now the vice president of the Philippines. His mm -hmm. son is now the, the mayor of Davao City. Uh, president Marcos mm -hmm. is himself the son of a president. Mm -hmm. Retaining that wealth, does it impede progress uh, uh, as opposed to some countries like, say, Vietnam, where there's a greater distribution of wealth? Well, the, uh, those are, of course, the challenges, uh, you know, being faced by not just the Philippines, but many other countries for that matter. And the government uh, is aware of that. So, uh, in fact, the uh, objective really is to spur, you know, growth and development, not just in the main centers of the country, but, you know, throughout, throughout the archipelago. Uh, to make uh, growth more inclusive, you know, more fair and more equitable. Uh, we've had uh, land reform uh, in the Philippines, uh, uh, breaking down, you know, uh, ownership of these big, you know, l l land companies and the rest. But uh, obviously, it's a it's a long process, you know, and uh, yeah, there is no single uh, solution uh, to. Uh, 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 you know, spurring uh, growth and development. But uh, I think uh, in general, uh, uh, with education, you know, we have a very high um, uh, literacy rate uh, in the country. So um, that uh, will um, empower and enable, you know, more families to really uh, progress, you know, uh, become better. And of course, the succeeding generations, you know, will succeed in their, in their careers. Bear in mind right now that you don't have to be a big landowner to, to get rich, you know. You just have to be successful in developing an app, you know. Uh, oh, uh, j just, just, uh, just one example to, 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 to really succeed, you know. Uh, I think the emphasis should be on intellectual property, you know. Uh, making sure that the, the, our people are able to seize on the uh, opportunities being presented by the current uh, uh, global economy, you know, which is more on to uh, innovation, technology, and um, yeah, finding solutions, you know, for the benefit of the, the, the bigger society. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that. And talking about developing an app, both The Economist and The New York Times mm -hmm. pointed out that that's the most logical progression for the Philippines, mm. that you have a pool of highly talented, very bright people who are now taking the next step from just mere services to providing actually innovate to move into an innovation culture. Mm. Can you, you have now obviously in the heart of Silicon Valley, mm. could you share with your audience perhaps a few examples that you might have of how companies in the Philippines are making the transition and how that's impacting the rest of the world? Mm. Uh, w one uh, 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 company in the Philippines that uh, was very successful uh, in developing such an app, uh, the app is called Emerge. In fact, uh, this, uh, this uh, app was awarded during the last APEC summit here in San Francisco so as one of the, uh, uh, it was recognized by APEC and they were awarded because of that uh, app that they have developed. And the app is targeted into assisting the small and micro uh, medium enterprises. So, so th that's one. And um, there's also this, uh, but this is not a, f uh, a Filipino based, but uh, a Filipino American uh, company. Uh, he developed an app here in, uh, he's based here in the Bay Area. At, now he has expanded to the Philippines, he's on to uh, financial services. It's uh, Plantina. So, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think. Uh, you know, these are very promising uh, developments, and uh, hopefully, more and more people will be encouraged to uh, you know, uh, you know, pursue and find solutions to the problems you know facing uh, you know, the Philippines and uh, globally, for that matter. And this is a question more for the audience. I know it's true that the Japanese invented the karaoke machine. But is it true that the Filipino people were the ones who popularized it and uh, there was a technically a scientist who really advanced it? Uh, <laughs> so now let us move on into 
another area of global warming. And if you take a look at the map of Manila, it tells you of a large percentage of Manila that will be underwater in about 20 years. Uh, and I think the, and if that isn't enough, the, Philippine, the Philippines sits on this region called the zone of fire or the ring of fire. And the ring of fire encirculates everything from Japan, California, the Philippines, and it is the site of enormous uh, volcanic activity. So let's start off with global warming. How does a country like the Philippines, which is at the vanguard, the forefront of global warming, where every day in the streets of Manila you will see flooding. How does the Philippines address that issue? And can it address the issue by itself? Or does it need help uh, from, uh, from, from the rest of the world? Mm. Uh, well, definitely we need the help of the rest of the world. And in fact, uh, uh, we've uh, had engagements with the US and Japan on climate-related uh, 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 issues, uh, climate adaptation, climate mitigation are priorities uh, for the government. Uh, of course, uh, uh, climate change is, is very real, you know, and uh, we really have to confront it uh, head on. And uh, you have correctly pointed out, you know, the challenges uh, being faced uh, by the Philippines. It may not be as grim as those uh, all those red colors that uh, we have uh, there, you know. But depending again on the progress of the of the uh, the, the global warming, but hopefully, you know, all countries will take their part and contribute in reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, like uh, what the Philippines is doing. The Philippines, uh, even if we are contributing only less than one percent of uh, greenhouse gas, we have uh, we are honoring our commitment under the UN uh, FCC agreement and the Paris Agreement as far as the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas uh, is concerned. So um, yeah, it's it's a it's a collective you know uh, uh, challenge for uh, the rest of the world. In fact, that uh, projections of you know cities being affected, it's not just for the Philippines. Even San Francisco, for that matter, uh, I've seen uh, 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 analysis on uh, uh, the impact of the sea level rise uh, within the city. Uh, it's a big challenge uh, for the Commonwealth Club with your uh, building here, a beautiful <laughs> one, quite close to the bay. You know, uh, also. Uh, uh, at risk uh, of being flooded because of, uh, of global warming. So it is really in our collective interest uh, to work together, you know, to uh, f uh, do the, the necessary work, you know, to protect our communities, you know, the livelihood and, 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 and the rest. And of course, the, the Philippines, the challenge is even bigger because of the nature of the country uh, as an archipelago. Yes, because obviously recent news have pointed out that the schools have closed in Manila because of the enormous heat index. Mm. Uh, is, and this is part of the general trend that we're seeing, that mm. storms are increasing in intensity mm. and increasing in frequency. Mm. And I think the question is, is the Philippines equipped to handle that? Uh, yes, we are doing our best to uh, address that, especially after our experience uh, not too long ago, you know, when there was this super typhoon that hit the Philippines, uh, uh, resulting in deaths of thousands of people. So since then, um, the government has undertaken the necessary efforts to really prepare uh, in advance, you know, uh, for these uh, big calamities, uh, especially typhoons uh, hitting the country. So... Yep, uh, and uh, we are again also working with the international community on this, um, um, including you know uh, uh, with the United States. So I think you are quite correct to pointing out what is happening in San Francisco. Mm. What is happening in Manila is also happening in San Francisco. Mm. And I think the larger question that perhaps the American audience can listen is to why would they care uh, about what is happening in Manila, uh, and how can and if they do care, how can they contribute? to helping the Fil Philippines, not just the Philippines, but other island nations, other coastline nations to handle that issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, th as I mentioned, we face the same challenges. Uh, we share the same ocean. You mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the distance between San Francisco and Manila, you know, and uh, yeah, uh, and yeah, we, we shared, you know, this big vast ocean, this big uh, water, you know, which, uh, 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 and it is our common interest to really work together.
to find uh, you know, solutions, you know, to make sure that uh, our cities are ready to face the challenges uh, posed by these uh, natural calamities, naturalists, especially the challenge posed by uh, climate change. So, all right. So, uh, we have received quite a few questions, mm. Councilor John Ferrer, mm. and some of them might be a test of your diplomatic skills. <laughs> So let us start off with perhaps some uh, easier ones mm -hmm. and uh, test your general knowledge. Uh, let's talk about the economy. What is the percentage of women-owned business in the Philippines? Oh, we have a very high percentage as far as women uh, own business. I don't know the exact number, but we do have a very high. And not just uh, women businesses, but also women professionals and even women in the foreign service. You know, the Philippines... Uh, I believe has, has even higher uh, percentage compared to the U.S. as far as the participation of the women in, you know, either in the economy, in governance. Um, um, we've had women presidents, you know, uh, in the Philippines, you know. So yeah, two already. So yeah, so so yeah, uh, we we are very progressive as far as uh, uh, women empowerment and women in government is concerned. So peaceful transition from power and women presidents. Yeah. Uh, uh, something to note. <laughs> uh, so here's a question asked by a fellow diplomat. Mm. And he's from Kazakhstan. Mm. And the question that he's asking as, from his perspective, as neighbors to a global giant and navigating complex geopolitical landscape, Kazakhstan and the Philippines face unique challenges and opportunities. Uh, what opportunities do you see for strategic partnerships between the two nations, particularly, and I'm assuming he means Kazakhstan, mm. particularly in areas like tourism, high-tech, biotechnology? Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, great questions, you know. Uh, definitely, uh, given our uh, uh, similar situation, you know, uh, it is uh, imperative for us to really uh, cooperate, work together to share our own uh, experiences uh, and best practices on how to deal with this. The Philippines is very open to uh, receiving, you know, uh, delegations from other countries sharing our own experience as far as, you know, uh, for example, we have a very well established uh, system uh, in terms of protecting uh, uh, overseas uh, workers. Uh, one of the well developed system uh, globally. Uh, also, given the big number of uh, Filipinos working uh, overseas, so we are prepared to share uh, that experience. We are also prepared, of course, to share our own experience as far as. Um, uh, you know, the, the growing uh, startup uh, ecosystem uh, environment uh, in the Philippines. So, yeah, I would be happy to sit down uh, with my colleagues uh, from Kazakhstan and, and, and other uh, countries to, to share uh, our own experience and to find ways for us to, to cooperate, to work together, and to find uh, uh, opportunities to uh, also uh, possibly increase our own uh, interaction between our two countries as far as trade and investment uh, are concerned. Thank you. Uh, this is more related to the economy. And how does the Philippine government plan to leverage interest in AI and other tech in bringing both investment and talent to the Philippines? Mm. Uh, of course, uh, uh, as far as AI is concerned, uh, we are not as well developed as, of course, uh, what you have here in, in uh, Silicon Valley and here in the United States. But the government is investing uh, on, 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 on that area. We have developed a center uh, on AI research. Uh, the best attraction that we have, as I said, is our people, you know, highly educated, talented, uh, really uh, uh, ready to, to support uh, the work uh, on, on those uh, uh, technologies. So we invite uh, the, the companies uh, uh, working on AI to, you know, to look at the Philippines, to hire people, and to, of course, uh, to, to invest in the country. Also, given our uh, very long experience as far as, for example, uh, handling uh, uh, business process uh, operations back home, you know, back office support. Uh, for those companies who would like, uh, for example, to train uh, you know, AI in terms of the large uh, language modules, then we have the data, you know, uh, you know, the, the 
companies operating in the Philippines and they have the data and the information. So it's really, you know, marrying the technology with those uh, uh, companies already undertaking uh, business uh, in their respective in their respective zones. But and of course, uh, obviously, the support of the uh, talented and qualified people are there, you know, to uh, whenever they need. And I think the question is a follow up question to that. Uh, they talked about how do they get more information about uh, about the Filipino Association, about the Philippines Association. Uh, on the economic uh, side, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, as I said a while ago, my colleague also from the Philippine Trade and Investment Center uh, in Silicon Valley are here, so we'll be happy to connect you with uh, you know, the necessary offices you know, back in the Philippines uh, that can support uh, your interest to open business uh, and other uh, possible connections or operations in the Philippines. Thank you. Uh, let me end with one that will certainly test your diplomatic skills. <laughs> And I will let you take a deep breath. And so the question is, who might President Marcos endorse in this year's US <laughs> presidential elections? <laughs> it is a genuine question. Yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Well, uh, you know, as, as diplomats, unfortunately, we cannot comment, you know, on, <laughs> on the, uh, you know, on the preference of the, uh, uh, you know, for, for leaders, but, Personally, I would say, and I personally believe in the wisdom of the American people, you know, that they will choose the, the leader of the country. And I also am I'm a strong believer, you know, uh, on the strength of your democratic institutions here. You know, so whoever will be elected president uh, surely will, uh, you know, will have the, the mandate of the people and the support of the democratic institution. And I personally am looking forward that he will continue, you know, the positive uh, momentum of engagement uh, with the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you, Council General Ferrer. And so with that, we come to the end of today's session. And I thank you all for attending this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.